I am Dr. Derek Lee. My pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Baron Lauder, who is the Chief of Minimally Invasive Scoliosis Surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And he's also a Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the Icon School of Medicine. Dr. Lauder is going to walk us through anterior surgical approaches to scoliosis correction, including DBT, ASC, and anterior fusion surgery. Uh, Dr. Lerner will also touch on his experience with uh, hybrid surgeries, which combine selective thoracic fusion and uh, lumbar tethers. He will also talk about his experience with Apothex, which is a new device to the U.S. And additionally, uh, I think Dr. Lerner is also going to touch on surgical options for adult scoliosis. That's a lot to cover, Dr. Lerner. I'll hand it over to you. Terrific, Derek. Thanks so much. And it's great to be here with you again. I enjoyed our last conversation. So if okay with you, I'll share my screen as a, as a means for presenting more of a, a pictorial outline for your audience. And then, you know, I hope that spurs on some discussion and I'm sure you'll have questions. And we'll, as you said, we'll cover some territory. Some of these procedures are a very different from what uh, we have offered uh, historically over the last you know, 20 to 30 years, certainly the, the period of time that I've been in practice. And I, I'm very excited to be able to offer my patients alternatives, both my pediatric and adult patients. And I'm sure you'll have some questions that may be uh, somewhat controversial and I'm happy to answer them to the best of my ability. So what I thought we could cover, um, with your guidance uh, is the first pediatric indications. Uh, we'll focus on non-fusion approaches that includes vertebral body tethering and ASC, anterior scoliosis correction, uh, the Apifix device, and then hybrid uh, fusion and uh, tether procedures. And then in the adult, I'll just show an example of the standard uh, posterior spinal fusion from the back of the spine, which is the standard as well as an anterior fusion where we can do a shorter uh, fusion operation and save the adult levels. And a recent patient that I operated on is a, is a good example of that, who I happen to see and follow up today in my office and is doing quite well. So uh, a number of years ago, uh, we studied uh, with our uh, research group, the, the um, uh, housed under the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation, uh, the HARM study group is the name of the research group. And we looked at uh, disc degeneration or wear and tear of the discs below a spinal fusion. And that was performed 10 years earlier in, in an adolescent patient. So these are patients now in their 20s, largely, uh, who had a fusion. And what we found is if their fusion was taken down to L4, the lower part of the, the lumbar spine, the unribbed spine, then the rate of disc degeneration. This, again, these are patients who are young, healthy otherwise in their 20s. Uh, more than a quarter of the patients, 27%, had significant disc degeneration. And if the fusion was to L3, that was 10%. For all comers, it was about 7%. And again, that's only a 10 years. So there can be an impact of spinal fusion on the remaining discs below and we can even see that beginning at 10 years follow-up. And the lower you go as a surgeon, if the lower we uh, fuse into the lumbar spine for the patient, the greater that impact is early on. So we really try to avoid fusion into the lumbar spine and wherever possible, we offer non-fusion techniques or just a selective fusion where we just fuse the thoracic spine. And that is certainly a reasonable approach for many patients. Um, and this is, happens to be a patient that I didn't operate on initially. She's uh, 40 years old at the time I met her a couple of years back, and she had a fusion to L2 in this case. That's an older type of instrumentation, but still the concepts are the same. She was fused to L2, but had a lot of disc degeneration and back pain below her fusion. And so uh, uh, because of that, we extended the fusion down. We had to do a combined uh, approach where we go through the front uh, anterior approach and we replaced uh, the, the discs with uh, these uh, metallic cages and then extended the instrumentation down to her sacrum and to the pelvis. So um, 
unfortunately, some patients will have this problem after a fusion uh, and this patient at age 40. Well, here's um, kind of our foray into non-fusion. And this was a, a patient of mine early on in my experience. This is a 10-year-old girl who I operated on almost six years ago. And she had a fairly large, almost 70 degree thoracic curvature. Again, the thoracic spine is the ribbed portion of the spine. The lumbar is the unribbed spine. And we, the family really did not want spinal fusion. So we, because her curvature was highly flexible, we offered her a, a vertebral body tethering procedure, a VBT. And you can see at her first visit, the first direct X-ray, she doesn't look so good in terms of the X-ray. She's leaning to the right. There's still a fair amount of residual curvature. And that we see that very often when we do these approaches because the patients are favoring the side of their incision. There's some discomfort and pain and uh, uh, they, they really, they can't do uh, very much uh, about standing upright in that early phase. So here uh, she's uh, leaning to the side and the left shoulder is up and, and uh, we've uh, let the family know that this is to be expected. And here she is coming to the finish line of growth at three years following surgery. And you can see that uh, she straightened out very nicely. She overcorrected a little bit in these lower segments. So the patients with growth, they have uh, this growth modulation process where correction occurs gradually over time because there's more, more growth on the concave side, the inner side of the curve, and less growth on the tethered side. And so she overcorrected. And today, with more experience, we leave a little slack in the lower segment so that we can avoid some of that overcorrection. But she's done really tremendously well uh, and she's fully active um, now, pretty much close to six years after surgery. And here she is, you can see the before and after uh, uh, clinical photos of her back. Um, what about disc releases? Because your audience, I think, might have questions about this. And this is a bit more controversial what is a disc release? Well, patients with a stiffer curve uh, where we, we don't see as much flexibility as, as we would like, we can offer a disc release which helps us to get more correction on the table. And we may tend to do that more frequently in a patient who is uh, approaching skeletal maturity. They're, they're, they have less growth remaining. But we don't do these routinely in those patients because we feel that uh, by cutting the disc, and that's the disc release is cutting the disc and allowing us to, to achieve more correction. But we, we can set the, the disc up for uh, disc degeneration, wear and tear that can be painful and uh, can cause uh, sciatica. So we, we especially avoid that to the, as much as we can in the lumbar spine, although we will occasionally perform it for larger curves. So that's what it looks like in surgery on the right. And I really have minimized our surgical pictures for the audience, but here is a, a picture of what this looks like. This is a disc release done from a posture approach. And this is a, a technique that I have uh, described with my uh, team where we do a disc release from the back. And this is in the setting of a spinal fusion. So you can see these are screws that we use for fusion, but I wanted to just illustrate the disc and this is the annulus, the outer portion of the disc, and the nucleus is the inner portion. So when we do a fusion, we completely remove all the disc material. But when we're doing a disc release, we're just cutting the disc, as you see here on the left side. And that allows, again, for more correction and more flexibility. And so this is a, a young lady who we did thoracic disc releases because she had a larger curve. It wasn't as flexible. And this allowed us to get a very satisfactory correction. And she was near maturity at the time we performed surgery. So here she is, she's actually closer to four years uh, out from surgery now. Uh, she's done exceptionally well. She's a volleyball player. And I wanted to show you what her back looks like before and after. So above is before, after is below. And you can see the symmetry of her body shape uh, really improving. You can see the, uh, the rotational uh, prominence, the uh, rotation has improved quite a bit. And you can see that on the pictures on the left side. And this is in the lumbar area where there's a tremendous amount of rotation before surgery. And without a disc release, you can see how much uh, improvement in that rotation there is. So we don't have to do a disc release 
to have improvements in, in uh, rotation, not by any means, especially in the, uh, the lumbar area. So um, there are uh, different exposures that we can use to get to the spine and you know, with whether we do disc release or not. So the exposures are, are, are really something that I've been doing for my entire career. So I've been practicing 26 years now. And uh, all those years back, uh, we were doing thoracoscopic fusion. So with very small portals or small incisions um, where we put the scope and camera in and we use these small incisions and we place the screws and do the, uh, in those days, the fusion technique. And today we use a variation of that. We, we do very small incisions. I tend to do a mini incision of, of about two to three inches at the apex, right at the, the main portion of the curve or just slightly below it. And then we'll do one or two uh, half inch incisions or uh, 15 millimeter incisions above uh, or sometimes below in order to access the many levels of the spine. And we can get eight, nine, 10 levels through very small and minimal incisions. And then we'll put a five millimeter or quarter inch incision in toward more toward the front uh, of the chest where we will eventually have a chest tube and we put a scope and camera in there. I really find that smaller incisions with less, especially with less uh, disruption of the muscles of the, of the chest wall of the side really results in a more a rapid recovery for the patient. I think easier recovery and better um, preservation of the patient's core strength, body strength. So we spend um, a lot of, uh, you know, we take our time to, to really keep the incision small and disrupt the, the uh, chest wall and, and side as minimally as possible. I really think it makes a difference. Um, but, you know, there are different ways to uh, perform surgeries. Just in my hands, this has worked out very well. Um, and, you know, with the, the, these minimal incisions, we've also seen very minimal blood loss. Um, and we don't see blood trans the need for blood transfusions in these operations, really have not. In all of my pediatric uh, patients that I've done this procedure in, not one of these patients has required a blood transfusion. They really lose very little blood. So... And then if we're doing a disc release, we'll do that through these small incisions. Dr. Warner, can I ask some questions about disc release? Yes, please. Um, it seems that every surgeon has their own particular definition of disc release. Some will do perhaps a small incision from uh, uh, the apex side. Others will do um, uh, a full incision along the front. Uh, do you have a specific technique to use or do you kind of uh, use different techniques depending on what the, the actual need is? But again, we, we use disc releases very selectively because number one, we don't have long-term follow-up on, on the, uh, the impact of a disc release. And um, you know, uh, the body is not intended to have the disc cut. Of course, with a, a more severe scoliosis that's more stiff and rigid, doesn't correct well, we've got to help it along, but we've got to be very selective in how we apply that. And I don't believe doing that routinely is a good way to go. Some surgeons I've talked to uh, are concerned that uh, if you do a bit of a disc release, then that could lead typically, or I should say in general to perhaps auto fusion of that particular level. Is that a concern as well? It can be, I, I haven't seen that. And I think that a big part of that is the technique that's used. Mm -hmm. So when we were doing fusions through the side a quarter century ago, um, we took the discs out completely and we, we, we removed the cartilage and the end plate so that we had bone, uh, the, the bone of the vertebra uh, of the building blocks of the spine exposed above and below the disc, and that would then come together and that would fuse over time. But when we leave the cartilage and the end plate intact, I, I think that really doesn't occur. There can be some scarring that occurs um, and maybe a little bit of stiffening, but I, I don't see the fusion. The bigger concern is, will there be back pain? And I think that we, we really have limited most of our disc releases to the thoracic but I will show you a case 
shortly where we did a disc release in the upper part of the lumbar spine. And I think the upper part of the lumbar spine is better than the lower part of the lower spine of the lumbar spine because there's less mobility there, there's less stress and load. And so I think there's less likelihood of, of disc degeneration, back pain and, and sciatica in those patients. But you know, time will tell with all of, well, all of this uh, innovative work, including disc releases and BBT and ASC, all of this will play out over the course of the next 20, 30 years as to how patients do in the long term. But the same is true for spinal fusion. I've done thousands of spinal fusions and I see uh, patients who have had other surgeons do the spinal fusions and they come to see me in follow-up and I treat adult patients as well. So I really have the, the benefit of seeing both pediatric and adult patients and the ramifications of spinal fusion. So fusion is not a, a perfect operation, even though it largely, once it heals up, it's stable, but the patients, as I said earlier, can develop problems below, they can develop problems above, and they often will lose mobility and have restricted motion. So we, by offering non-fusion techniques, I think we have uh, the ability to preserve motion and flexibility, and we have the potential to minimize the problems below and above that occur after fusion. Absolutely, because those segments are still flexible to some extent as well. Yes. Uh, just a couple of follow-up follow -up questions. Uh, it's because this release, um, how does the pain, where does the pain come from? Is it because you're lowering the height of the disc with the release that you increase compression of the nerves through the IVFs? Or is it compression of the uh, posterior joints of the vertebra? What's, what's causing, or what's the possible uh, outcome of a disc release in terms of pain? What is the nature of the pain? Oh, that's a great question. And it's probably multifactorial, some of all of the above. Some of it is just by cutting the disc and you know the disc provides some stability of the spine. So it allows there to be more uh, mobility or hypermobility of the spine. And that can lead to arthritis of the joints in the back, the facet joints they're called. Um, it also can impact the way the ribs articulate uh, or connect to the spine. And so if there's collapse of the disc because you've done the disc release, the rib uh, orientation to the spine may change and there can be rib pain as well. And also just by collapsing the disc space, the, the foramen or the exiting opening for the nerves that, that exit the spinal cord um, they can, that can be narrowed and the nerves can be compressed so the patients can develop sciatica. And also just by cutting the disc, you injure it and you set it up for its own process of uh, wear and tear and the disc itself can be a source of pain. We see that with some patients who have a collapsed disc. They may not have um, sciatica, but they can just have back pain and that can sometimes be related to the disc itself. So there are all those uh, possible causes of pain. And so if we don't have to cut the disc, again, because we certainly don't have um, evidence uh, one way or another, but I can tell you that it's better to leave the disc intact in general if we can avoid it, especially if we have a flexible curve. Well, with some curves uh, being quite severe, uh, some surgeons say that the disc is very uh, degenerated or begin with, right? And if that's the case, is a disc release as problematic or will that, you know, the disc is already not in the best shape anyway? Is that something yeah. to take into consideration? That's a great question. Uh, well, actually, having been there uh, many times um, and um, taken out discs in, when we were doing spinal fusions, and these were for very severe curves, Actually, in, in the, the, the pediatric population, adolescents, uh, uh, patients, and, and children, the discs actually look very healthy, and they are very healthy. They're, when we take them out, we kind of feel badly about removing them because they're healthy, but we're, when we're doing a spinal fusion, it, it's okay because you're, not, you're eliminating motion anyway, but the discs are healthy. They get uh, degenerated and, and become unhealthy uh, in the adult patient uh, with long-standing scoliosis. So in our pediatric patients, 
I don't recommend uh, uh, you know, taking the disc or releasing the disc or injuring the disc um, unless we really are pushed to do so. And there may be cases where the curve is just too big and it may be just the most prudent thing is to offer a fusion, but then push the envelope in the lumbar spine where we wanna preserve flexibility, where the patient and family would like you know, their child to have as much mobility to pursue their sports and their activities. And again, less likelihood to develop uh, problems below if, if their child were to have a fusion. So we push the envelope more in the lumbar spine but I think for larger curves in the thoracic spine, it's probably best to do a, a, a fusion. And again, we limit that as much as we can. Uh, just one last follow-up question. Uh, when you do do the uh, disc release, do you um, release the full uh, width of the disc? I shouldn't say width, the length of the disc anteriorly. Do you also release the anterior longitudinal ligament as well? We do, we do. So when we're, if we're going to do a disc release, you have to re release enough of the disc to, to make the spine mobile and um, to get enough flexibility to make it worthwhile. So we do, we'll take the anterior longitudinal ligament and we'll take two thirds or more of the annulus, which is the surrounding a portion of the disc. I think if I go backwards, there it is. So this um, is the technique from the back, but when we're doing an anterior uh, through the side disc release when we're doing these procedures, we're going to come way around to this side and we can really get around very, very effectively. You get a sense of it here, but we're coming around, we're taking the anterior longitudinal ligament and much of this annulus is cut. So actually, if I could, if you could go back to that uh, previous graphic, sure. I was on the impression that a lot of posterior fusion surgeries leave the discs as spacers and basically um, will remove posterior elements of the spine then you know add bone chips to fuse but you prefer to take uh, the discs or is that more of a uh, more of a sagittal curve concern for you or yeah. is it just a I, better I, result i didn't show you the cases but uh because I wanted to limit it, but uh, we only do that when we have to, when, because the patient has a very large curve. And um, so I described this technique several years ago, and we've done a number of patients' operations with this uh, technique of release only when they have very severe curves. So it was, instead of in the past, we would go through the side, do the disc release, and then do a fusion from the back. Here, we are able to do the disc release from uh, all from the back, from a posterior approach. So it's just a way of getting more done from one incision so as to minimize the impact on the patient. And again, it's only for the most severe curves. For the vast majority of fusions, we do it all from the back, you're right. Here's a, a patient who, in whom we did do a disc release. Now we didn't take it all the way down to the lower lumbar, but this is a 13 year old girl. She actually has cerebral palsy I operated on her uh, about three months ago now, or a little under three months ago. And you can see she had a very large curve here, almost 90 degrees. And we did disc releases uh, at, um, in the lower part of the thoracic and just into the upper part of the lumbar spine. And we placed a double row of screws most of the way in order to get an adequate correction. And you can see we corrected her so much uh, in the thoracal lumbar spine here at the, the main curve that the upper curve is a little bit uh, curved itself going in the opposite direction. But some of that, um, remember I talked about the lean that the patients have early on in that first direct x-ray in the first patient I showed, uh, they lean to the side. So she's leaning a little bit and that's part of it. But because of her cerebral palsy and my concern for that left shoulder, we put her in a brace just to hold the, the shoulder down while she uh, recovers from surgery so that this doesn't develop a life of its own, this upper curve here. But I just wanted to show the power of a disc release when we do it for a very large curve. And again, very seldom, but occasionally we'll do um, a lumbar disc release in the upper part of the lumbar spine, as we did here. How do you know 
which disks to release? Is it something that you determine on the actual operating table or with pending x-rays? Uh, what's your thought process there? Yes, um, a little bit of both, but mostly on the bending x-ray. The bending x-ray tells us which disks are really not able to correct adequately just through uh, flexibility. Um, so the ones that are still, you know, uh, kind of wedged, or, and um, I, if I go back to the this picture here, here's a bending x-ray, and you can see there's still uh, kind of an opening of the disc on the, the outer side. And these are the discs, one, two, three, that will release, occasionally we'll do a fourth one, uh, as opposed to here where it opens up. It opens up on the opposite side. So we'll just do the discs that don't fully correct on the bending x-ray. And we can see some of that in, in surgery, but we, we like to rely mostly on the preoperative bending x-ray to guide us because in the, in the operating room, the patient is fully relaxed, they're sleeping, they're anesthetized, the muscles are relaxed, and we may get a false sense of security about how much correction there'll be. So we really try to focus more on the preoperative x-ray, the bending x-ray, as you suggested. Um, and I just wanted to show here, this is a, a young man He's uh, five and a half years out from surgery. Here were his curves prior to surgery. And actually, you'll see that he's, um, he's got some broken um, tethers where I have the red line. So here he is on the right initially early on after surgery, and he's almost perfectly straight. And over time, over this five and a half year period of time, there's a break between the, 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 uh, between the screws because you can see that the screws splay open a little bit. And um, that is an indication that the cord likely broke at several levels. But despite that, he's holding on beautifully and he has really no symptoms. He's fully active, plays basketball, he's a college student now. And um, here's what he looks like clinically. Um, so, you know, he's just doing very, very well, active. And despite the breaks, you know, we expect that the cord is not likely to last forever uh, in most patients. And one day we're going to have improved cords and we're working on that with uh, uh, the implant company. And then we'll get through the, in the United States, the FDA regulatory, and you're from Canada, it'll go through Canadian regulatory, I'm sure. At some point we'll have cords that'll be longer lasting. But even with breakage, we often will see the patients are holding their curves. And we see a lot of cord breakages. And I've, in my practice, have had to do very few revision surgeries, fortunately, as a result. Dr. Lawrence, since you brought it up, do you have any uh, uh, idea in terms of timeline when a uh, new tether will be on the market? Uh, yeah, I, I suspect it'll be a couple of more years to go um, because, you know, it's one thing to have the idea and then. Uh, we have the material that we can use, and then we have to go through testing of that material, and then we take it to the regulatory agencies. And you know, FDA in in our country uh, is it's an excellent um, body, and it really helps to keep patients safe uh, through adequate testing. But it, you know, that process takes a lot of time. So I suspect it'll be a couple of more years before we get the new cords in. You know, just uh, for your audience, just this is how we return our patients uh, to activities. I, uh, this happens to be one of my patients who uh, was a, or is a rhythmic gymnast in her country in Chile, in South America. She got back to her uh, uh, routine, her, her training at five weeks after surgery, which was maybe one week before I usually would say it's okay, but five weeks. And then she actually qualified for the nationals in her country for rhythmic gymnastics at three months, which was pretty remarkable. And that's after a tether. Um, so in my routine, we send the patients, uh, not everybody likes the swimming pool. I personally do, I love the pool. And I encourage our, our patients to get into the swimming pool, uh, both pediatric and adults at three or four weeks after surgery. And they can walk and do kickboard. And that helps them really get their core uh, strength back. Uh, and then we'll send them for flexibility and core strengthening and, and formal physical therapy uh, beginning at six weeks. And then uh, really start them back on their sport or dance 
uh, by six to eight weeks. So really get going early on. And then we'll watch our patients closely. If they're still growing, we'll watch them every six months. And as they reach maturity, then we'll, we'll spread out the visits a little further and further, uh, uh, you know, span a, a, a larger length of time between. But we'll follow our patients until, uh, well, in my case, till I retire, and then somebody else will follow them because it's really our duty to um, understand the long-term outcomes of these procedures. And, and we'll continue to watch our patients very closely. Dr. Water, do you have any concerns about uh, uh, increase in uh, perhaps tether ruptures with uh, uh, physical activity? Uh, what's your sense in your practice? Well, yeah, there's that's a, a dual-edged sword, a double-edged sword. So uh, on the one hand, you know, the patients who gravitate and the families who gravitate to this procedure, they have often their children are, are very uh, much engaged in activities and sports and dance that requires flexibility and they want to pursue their passion. And so we've encouraged that. But on the other hand, the more you do, the more wear and tear on the material there is. And that's true whether you drive a car and you wear out the shock absorbers or the brake pads, or you uh, are a marathon runner and you maybe put a lot of mileage on your knees or lower back. Um, the same thing is true for the tether, but in, in my practice and with the families, we've had these discussions and I encourage them to get on with their lives and to have a full life. We'll sometimes double up the cord and do a double tether with two cords, um, particularly in the lumbar spine, occasionally in the thoracic spine to, I think, give it more durability. Um, but we tend to let them, let them really pursue their passion. So, and you know, this is just a collage of some of our patients, dancers and swimmers, the young man on the right who's lifting that, those heavy weights, that probably does put some load on the tether. Uh, he's the first patient that we know of in the United States who's had a tether and then uh, has been able to enlist in, in his case an ROTC in the Army uh, undergraduate uh, college uh, program. And his, his uh, goal in life is to become a um, an officer in the United States Army. So uh, he had the tether. If he had had a fusion, he would not have been able to pursue a career in the armed forces. And he's a very nice young man uh, from uh, uh, out, uh, out West Coast. Um, if I may change gears for a second, uh, this is a, a procedure that some of your audience may have heard of, and it's called Apifix. It's also, we call it posterior dynamic correction. Basically, we can offer this kind of internal brace uh, for patients who have curves that are getting worse despite bracing. And I think the, the best patients are still growing, have small curves that are flexible. And we can put this device in with two screws at the top, one at the bottom, and then this device ratchets. It actually opens up and it rotates and allows some flexion and extension. Um, so through a, a, an incision in the back, we can, this patient has this incision, we can place this device. And she was back on her bicycle at three weeks after surgery and uh, one night in the hospital. And it kind of served as a, a internal brace. And we've kind of used this more for the, the smaller curves, patients who are still growing, although uh, the FDA indication includes patients who have reached maturity, even adults uh, who are, have adolescent onset scoliosis. So I think this is really going to play a role for a lot of patients. Maybe those who are less demand, lower demand, probably would not use this for um, a, a gymnast or a major a dancer, because I, I worry about um, the device not holding up. But it's been very nice. Uh, offering for the families who fit the, the kind of the, the right characteristics. Again, there are those patients who have more severe curves or rigid stiff curves, and probably those are best treated with a fusion. And so, and this patient is a young lady from uh, Malaysia. Um, the family uh, was seeking non-fusion alternative, but she has a curve uh, just below her neck call that a proximal thoracic curve. 
and then a main thoracic curve. And there's no way we can correct this proximal curve with a tether. We can't get that high. So in order to give her the best possible outcome, we fused the upper two curves, but we left her lumbar spine completely free and in fact, part of the thoracic. And we did a tether below. So we do in the same day, a fusion from the back, and then we go in through the side and then uh, provided a double, double cord uh, tether. And she's really doing very nicely almost a year out now, actually a year out. And this is her, um, I think we have a little video of our friend from Malaysia. And, and she is back home a few weeks after surgery. And it just gives you a sense of really how dramatically uh, the patients can return to their activities only a few weeks after, after these types of procedures. So it's remarkable. And I, I actually just love that swimming pool. I wish I could get in the pool myself. Here's another patient, similar, very large curve in the thoracic region. And then this upper curve here, if we were to try to tether this, we're not going to be able to get an adequate correction, even with a disc release. And we're also not gonna be able to control this upper curve. And then if you were to correct just the lower curve here, the uh, lower thoracic curve, we probably would throw up the left shoulder. So we just address both curves. We straighten this out nicely. And then again, a double cord below. So it's almost the best of both worlds. We have a very reliable correction up above and we maintain flexibility and mobility below uh, with the promise or the hope that she'll have less problems uh, below the tether and within the tether than she would have had she had a fusion all the way down to, to those levels that are shown there. I also wanted to show you some of the scars. So you asked about uh, the approaches and the incisions. We tend to do these through these small incisions. These are fairly fresh, so they're still a little red for this young lady, but we use the scope and very small incisions. This is mostly hidden by the patient's bra or bathing suit and their arm. Um, and here's one for a, a more of a lumbar curve, and uh, it's generally hidden very nicely by the arm. So it's, um, and we keep the incisions pretty small. And here is what a fusion, this is a hybrid patient. So the fusion is here. We do this incision here. And uh, here's a, a tether uh, for the, uh, the left-sided approach of the lumbar curve. I also wanted, I think you asked about uh, pulmonary or lung function after these procedures. And what we, we've done some research, uh, probably almost 10 years ago, I published this with colleagues on the approach. So thoracotomy is a, a bigger incision into the side, into the chest. Thoracoscopic is when we use the smaller incisions that I showed you just a moment ago. And then thoracoabdominal is the lumbar incision. And what we see is for the thoracotomy, there's a decrease. This is the, a change from before surgery to two-year follow-up. And there is a decrease in lung function. FEV1 is forced expiratory volume in one second. FVC is forced vital capacity and TLC is total lung capacity. The details of that aren't as important, but just to show that you can see vital capacity and, and uh, the ability to exhale quickly is impacted by a, a larger incision. And when we use the scope, there's actually an increase, an improvement in lung function after surgery. So small incisions are better. And when in this other study uh, by colleagues, even going from the back, from a posterior approach for fusion, uh, when this was combined with rib resection, thoracoplasty, there was a greater percentage of patients who had a decline in their lung function. And here is open anterior. This is the thoracotomy, the bigger incision more of these patients had a loss of lung function. When we did it purely thoracoscopically and 40 patients here, there's only a very small percentage that, sorry, that had a decline. And when we look at our data, uh, some of these actually overall on average had a slight improvement. So these small incisions versus a big incision, I think are really important for the effect on lung function. So I really work hard to minimize the incisions in these patients for this reason. And then a more recent paper by Dr. Trobisch and his group, he's in Germany. They showed basically, there are a lot of numbers here and I'm not gonna go through all of it, but by 12 months 
uh, the pulmonary function returned in, in patients, whether it was a lumbar tether, whether it was thoracic or both sides and both thoracic and lumbar, by, uh, by 12 months, the patients really were improved. Uh, and that's been my experience. And I find that they're improved even by three to six months in the vast majority, especially with small incisions. And so some ask me, how do you uh, guide patients uh, between a fusion, uh, tether, apothex? There's some overlap. Uh, fusion is probably an option for all patients. Uh, tether only for certain patients but, and, and the same for apothex. So I won't necessarily belabor all the points, but what we try to do is to go through the indications, fusion, tether, apothex, how much motion is spared, what the approach is like from the back, from the side, blood loss, which is really very minimal for tether and apothex. Infection risk is extremely low for all the procedures, but particularly so for tether and apothex. The hospital stay now for apothex is the shortest. It's about a day, one night in the hospital. And return to activities as quick as for tether and for apothex, et cetera, et cetera. So, and of course, the newer procedures, tether and apothex, we don't have long-term follow-up. And so that time will tell, but this I think serves as a, as a guide for families and helps them hopefully in their decision-making. We talk about potential complications, which fortunately are extremely uh, rare and very low for all the patients. Of course, cords can break. That doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a reoperation. And so far the reoperation rates have been very low and um, you know they're low for fusion. And so far they've been very low for apothex, but time will tell. So this is what we go through and I spend a lot of time discussing with the families what we know, what we don't know, pros and cons, and the characteristics of each procedure. And it's up to not me, but it's up to the families and the patient to decide what is best tailor-made to them uh, and their comfort level and what are their goals in life. And I think that's where medicine and surgery have changed so dramatically in the last five to 10 years. It's more customized. And precision based on personal goals and aspirations. And we give the families the information and they say, okay, how can we guide you? And, you know, how do you want to proceed? And, and that's a big, big change. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about uh, the other side of the equation, and that is the adult patient. Um, and we learned some things about, um, you know, and talking and spending a lot of time speaking with families and, their, and the, the larger family unit and the patient, a lot of our patients are skeletally mature, uh, adolescent, often girls, but boys as well, who no longer have growth, but they ha are you know, faced with a significant scoliosis. And you know, there are choices. One can uh, delay surgery because the curves are going to get worse largely if they're over 50 degrees, but that's a slow process. And so sometimes families have asked, what does that look like over the course of a lifetime? What would happen if I, my daughter or son delays surgery and they do it in their adult years? So we did that study where we took patients from our adolescent uh, registry and uh, uh, many of those, the patients in the adolescent registry had surgery. So we were able to see what the surgery was like and the levels fused, et cetera, et cetera. This was for spinal fusion, not for tether. And then we had a, another registry, which is an adult registry. So what we could do is basically say the, cur the patient on the left with this 57 degree thoracic curvature, if the natural history took hold and there's the gradual progression that we expect and similar curve types, this is kind of what it would look like 20 or 30 years down the line. And so we took adolescent patients and we matched them to adult patients who had similar uh, curves, but larger based on the natural history of uh, uh, information and data that we have. And so what we found essentially with this paper that we published a few years ago in 2019 was that um, the adult patient is likely to have a much longer spinal fusion, um, often 
fused down to the sacrum and including the pelvic uh, bones, fixation to the, pel to the pelvis, uh, with much higher blood loss and, and um, longer operative times, and also five times greater major complication rates. So 25% major complication rates in adults undergoing spinal fusions compared to their uh, adolescent counterparts, 25% versus 5%. And in the adult patients, you can see because of these secondary curves that occur below and there's a lot of disdegeneration and wear and tear, they often require that fusion to go down to the very bottom of the spine, to the sacrum. So it takes away their flexibility, higher complication rates, more blood loss, and uh, much bigger operation. So that's just, you know, it gives a, the one additional aspect of, of information. But here's a, a patient, she's 53 years old, and she avoided scoliosis surgery her whole life. Um, and she was a, had done many marathons and really very dynamic uh, woman. Her name is Robin, and she's on the internet and doesn't mind us using her name. And she finally came to me a number of years ago and said, I just can't carry on anymore. My back is too painful. My curve is getting worse. I can't run marathons. I, I can barely do anything that I enjoy doing, including hiking. So uh, because of the curve and it extended down into her lower lumbar spine and the discs were very significantly degenerated, there was really no option other than spinal fusion. And we did a, a traditional fusion operation from the back. We placed these cages in the disc spaces below and we restored her alignment. And um, she, and these, this is what the discs look like degenerated, they're collapsed, they're bulging, and they're just, you know, it's almost bone on bone. And, you know, after surgery, you know, despite the fact that she had a spinal fusion, she really, uh, Robin got back to her life. She went hiking and climbing the Grand Canyon and back to weightlifting and swimming. And uh, she was big soul cycle uh, proponent. She's on her bicycle all the time. So she's really, you know, gotten back to her fullest function and maybe not what she was before she had uh, this progressive and uh, severe scoliosis with so much back pain, but really has gotten back to a full life. So, you know, we have to offer the operation that makes the most sense to the patient and one can still live a full life uh, with, with the best operation that's tailored to the, to the patient. And then I just wanted to show one other adult uh, patient. This is a 37 year old woman with a very large curve, almost 90 degrees. And she's becoming increasingly disabled. She's a pharmacist, has a young family, and she's just really having a great deal of difficulty, seven out of 10 back pain and you know, the operation that was recommended to her was one that would address both curves, a fusion from the upper part of her thoracic spine all the way down to the bottom again. But her discs were relatively healthy here. You know, this disc is a little darker than we'd like to see, but it's the disc space is maintained. This one above is, is well-maintained and the one here. So we felt there were three reasonably good discs and we could do something shorter and, and avoid. So instead of fusing both curves, we just did going through the side as we do now for the tether procedure, we do an anterior or side approach and we fused four segments of her spine. Uh, sorry, five, five, six vertebra and five motion segments, but we left three discs below untouched. We did not fuse the upper curve but she's got a very nice correction. I actually just saw her today in the office and uh, she's doing very nicely. So we can sometimes do less fusion and with the goal of preserving as much flexibility and function for the long-term as possible. Um, and here she is, this is still early on. This was her last visit where she still has some skin glue over where the incision is. But again, this small, relatively small incision as opposed to this is before surgery here on the left, as opposed to doing something from the upper part of her thoracic spine all the way down to the bottom. So we did this side approach again through a relatively small incision. 
really the way I approach patients is to try to provide as much information as possible. What are the options? And then align my recommendations and the approaches with, the, with what the patient and family goals are. And we do this in a way to minimize complication, complications and to maximize and optimize recovery and, and function. So how can we get patients back as efficiently as possible with as few bumps in the road as possible. And I think the non-fusion techniques have really been spectacular for their promise and, and what we've been seeing in their recoveries. Uh, and I believe there'll be more developments that will make them even better over the, over the years to come. So I, I hope you found that useful, Derek, and I'm all yours for any questions. Oh, for sure. Um... You know me, I can't um, not ask questions. For I know with the anterior fusion, it's kind of a lost art over the last 20, 25 years or so. Yeah. You definitely find there's a bit of a resurgence coming back because of its um, ability to, to uh, well, its advantages versus the disadvantages of uh, posterior fusion. I, I would like to say that that is the case, but I, I think there is some of that. It depends on you know, the patient population to some extent. I would say in my own practice, there's a resurgence, and I believe that we'll see a resurgence over time. Um, you know, the advantages of the anterior surgery for fusion is we can do shorter fusions, as I just showed with that last patient. We, there's less blood loss and we avoid the muscles of the back. So we're not dissecting and moving the muscles of the back aside. So there's in some ways less recovery, but I would say it hasn't taken hold yet. Um, but I, I really think there's room for it to, to come back and I believe it will. Um, there are more of the anterior surgeries being done for adults that have degenerative disc disease so procedures through the side where a one or two level fusion is done uh, for you know, collapsed discs and um, sciatica and the like, and degenerative scoliosis as opposed to idiopathic genetic scoliosis that is really the, the crux of my practice and many others. So, but I do think there is a role for it and I'm excited to get back to it for the reasons uh, that I just mentioned. And, uh, that what we discovered so many years ago was shorter fusions, less blood loss, more, um, um, you know, I think longer term maintaining of function because we, we could do a shorter fusion. And I really think uh, there'll be a big role for it to play in the future. With lumbar fusions, you'll, you'll see them using like yourself, uh, cages, et cetera, to, uh, to act as spacers, right? Do you yes. see anything in the future being developed where there are uh, artificial discs that can be used in areas where, there, where flexibility is maintained as opposed to fusion? So I think um, the problem is the artificial discs don't do well in the face of scoliosis, where there could be a role. And years ago, we did a biomechanical study looking at this. If the patient needed a correction of the scoliosis, potentially you could do a fusion of the scoliosis. Let's, this is for adult patients. And maybe there'll be non-fusion that is more, um, uh, that is developed for the adult population. And I have to say in my practice, I have done adult uh, uh, ASC or tether procedures. Um, and I think, you know, that's, the, the long-term outcomes will, be, will determine how successful they are, clearly. But there may be a role for putting a total disc replacement below a fusion or even below a tether. And if, if the discs have collapsed and they're, they're, you know patient has back pain below. And we did the biomechanical study that showed that is feasible. The discs actually held up underneath a fusion. But I think that's... Um, no time will tell on that. But for now, I think um, when we can get to patients early before their discs degenerate, I think that's the best scenario for getting correction without fusion. All right. Well, Dr. Lonner, I want to really thank you for um, giving, you, giving us so much time and so much patience. And uh, thank you for once again 
teaching me so much and I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Derek, and best of luck and keep up the good work. You're educating a lot of people and I think it's, you've got a terrific show. Okay, thanks very much. Have Thank a great you. day. You too, take care. Bye-bye.